seed droppers. One of my favorite things when witnessing to a Jehovah's Witness. Now, if you haven't watched my previous videos about Jehovah's Witnesses, that's okay. I am assuming that uh, most people have watched those videos in preparation for this because most of this video is going to be about the deity of Jesus and the Trinity and how to show the Jehovah's Witness from their own Bible, their own publications, that Jesus is God. Now to be clear, these are not gotcha tactics. I see a lot of Christians sometimes that just love to put Jehovah's Witnesses in a corner and just, oh, gotcha, what are you gonna say now? And I just don't find that to be very fruitful. I don't find it to be very fulfilling. I think that feeds their martyr complex. The idea is to let them save face because they're not going to admit when they're wrong right then and there to you, but to kind of plant seeds that will grow over time. A Jehovah's Witness is a whole different evangelistic beast. I think there's a right way and a wrong way to talk to a Jehovah's Witness. If you can't do it in love, don't do it at all. Jehovah's Witnesses are people too. They have feelings. They have lives. As Rabbi Zacharias would say, if truth is not undergirded in love, it makes the possessor of that truth obnoxious and the truth repulsive. I do go over this in much more detail in my previous videos. But what these are, these are seed droppers. These are my most favorite methods that I have used over the years that I have found to be very fruitful and effective when talking to a Jehovah's Witness. And they're quick and they're easy. First off, Jesus is God. Tell your friends. You can show this to the Jehovah's Witness using their own scriptures. And I'm going to show you how you can do this. Now, the Jehovah's Witness publications that I'm going to be using in these methods, I you can get on eBay. I'm sure that there's even Jehovah's Witnesses in your area that would even let you borrow these. Um, in fact, this one um, in particular, the Kingdom Interlinear, which we will be using, I had a Jehovah's Witness let me have this. That was really hard to get. So for them to let me have this was a big deal. There's an older translation of the Kingdom Interlinear. Uh, it's their purple book. I got this one on eBay. And then their actual Bible translations. This is their new one that they have. Before then, you had the 1984 edition. They change their publications often. Uh, and the one before that is the 1950s version. This one I got on eBay. These two, you can probably just get a hold of at your local Kingdom Hall or your Jehovah's Witness friends or on eBay. And then the next one I'm going to use, which might be a little harder to get a hold of, but you can get a hold of it. Um, again, either on eBay or there's other ministries out there that you can actually get a hold of all these publications with is <laughs> their reference New World Translation. This is, it's a really thick book, but it's very useful because it shows a lot of the references that we're going to go over in this video. There will be one particular reference that I use the reference New World Translation for. So strictly using these, all of these in and, and some fashion, I'm going to show you how you can show the Jehovah's Witness that Jesus is indeed God and they can see it in their own scriptures. First thing we're going to show is that Jesus is prayed to. We are going to look at Acts 7.59 for this one. Now, this is where Stephen is being stoned. Now, remember, you are going to want to use their translation. They believe that their translations and their publications are superior to what you have. The goal is, is that they're not going to doubt what they see in their own translation. So, uh, Acts 7.59, this is where Stephen is being stoned. This is what it says in their translation. I'm using the silver one that they have. I'm actually going to start in verse 58 for the context. It says, after throwing him outside the city, they began stoning him. The witnesses laid down their outer garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they were stoning Stephen, or Stephen, he made his appeal, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then kneeling down, he cried out with a strong voice, Jehovah, do not charge the sin against them. And then he fell asleep in death. Now it's worthy to note that in verse 60, this reads incorrectly. It should say, Lord, do not charge the sin against them. We all know that in context, he's referring to Jesus as Lord. The New World Translation changes that to Jehovah. But in the Greek, it reads differently. The name Jehovah never once appears in the New Testament scriptures. The Jehovah's Witnesses add this over 200 times to put more emphasis on the name of Jehovah. 
but the only Lord ever spoken of in the entire New Testament is Jesus. So that's noteworthy, but moving on. Now, what the Jehovah's Witness will say is that, oh, he had a vision. He, he had a vision of Jesus, but he didn't actually, that didn't actually happen. It was just a vision. So here's the issue with this, though. Here's my pickle with this situation and this argument. They'll say that in verse 56, he looks up and the heavens are opened up and he sees Jesus. Well, what they forget is that he was basically drug out of town and then stoned. And that's whenever he looked up and talked to Jesus. He prayed to Jesus. So um, to say that that's a vision is kind of a stretch. However, there's more to this than that. Here's what you're going to want to do. You can do this in a reference New World translation, or you can do this in their own interlinear translation. I will be using the navy blue one just because it's closer and not as big and heavy. Now I'm going to put this up on the screen so you can see it, but look at the Greek here in verse 59. It says, and they were throwing stones at Stephen, calling upon and saying, Lord Jesus. I mean, Greek reads differently and it's, it's a different order than what we have in English, but he's saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, calling upon. Now, if you look over here on the right, you see made appeal, it's circled, and there's a little star next to it. Well, look down here at the bottom. Okay, down here at the bottom, it says, or invocation or prayer. He invoked Jesus. He prayed to Jesus. He called upon Jesus. So it's interesting that in their own interlinear, they know that this is correctly translated as invocation or prayer. They just can't add that because Jesus being prayed to is an abomination to a Jehovah's Witness. Now, the chances of this actually being translated as made appeal is very small, but because they can grammatically get away with it, that's how they choose to translate it. Now I'm going to show you the same exact thing in their reference neural translation, just so you can see an image of it. Um, it's the same thing. You can see the little star. And then if you go down to the bottom, verse 59, you see the star or invocation or prayer. So they know <laughs> that this is uh, basically the same word that they're using for prayer or invocation. The other thing about this that I find very interesting in the just the general context of what's happening is let's just pretend that it does say made appeal, that that's the, you know, proper way to translate it. What business does Stephen have even making any kind of appeal to Jesus when Jehovah is the only one that's worthy of that at all? If the heavens open up and he's trying to appeal for help, why is he asking Jesus and not Jehovah? Another instance that you can show that Jesus is prayed to is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 8. This is the infamous scripture where Paul's talking about the thorn in his side. Now, you can read this in their silver Bible or the older 1984 version, but this is how it reads. To keep me from becoming overly exalted, I was given a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan, to keep slapping me. That's how it reads in the New World Translation. It's a little awkward. So that I might not be overly exalted. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it would depart from me. But he said to me, my undeserved kindness, which remember, they don't say grace in the New World Translation. It's undeserved kindness, is sufficient for you. For my power is being made perfect in weakness. Now, this is interesting. Paul begged Jesus to take away the thorn in his side. How did he do that? He begged the, the Lord Jesus? Why not Jehovah? What does it entail whenever you're pleading your case to an unseen being asking them to help you? You're praying to that unseen being asking them to help you. You're invoking their help. Paul talked to Jesus. That's interesting to show to a Jehovah's Witness. So if Paul begged Jesus for help, why can't you, Jehovah's Witness, why can't you ask Jesus for help? The bottom line is, is that Paul has no business praying, talking to, asking Jesus anything if he's not God. The point is, is that if any Jehovah's Witness were to beg Jesus for anything, that would be seen as blasphemous. So why is it okay for Paul to do it? The next thing is Jesus was worshiped. Now the New World Translation has changed every place where Jesus is worshiped, where it says that he was worshiped to did obeisance to, where it's like where you show reverence or something. But to them, it wasn't 
that he was worshipped at all. They took all that out. But you can still show that he was most definitely worshipped. And I'll show you how. One that you're going to want to go to in their translation is Revelation 5, verses 13 through 14. Starting in verse 13, it says, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all the things in them, saying to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb, be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the might forever and ever. The four living creatures were saying amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. So they worshiped the lamb to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb. They bow down and worshiped. The next one you're going to want to go to, you're going to need your handy dandy 1950s version, New World Translation. It has quite the pickle in it. Sorry, I just have so much fun with this. This is in Hebrews 1. We're going to look at verse 6. In the 1950s version of the New World Translation, it reads, this. But when he again brings his firstborn into the inhabited earth, he says, let all God's angels do obeisance? No, it says worship him. Now in the 1984 version and the 2003 edition, it says that the angels did obeisance to him. But here's the thing. It has to read worship. I always wondered why they didn't change it in their old publication because they didn't believe Jesus was God back then or that he could be worshiped. So why did they change it in every other place except that one? I'm going to show you why it has to say that Jesus was worshiped by the angels and you can show the Jehovah's Witness this. Now for this, you are going to want to use the reference New World Translation. Now I'm gonna put it up on the screen. I'm gonna show you what it says in the reference New World Translation, Hebrews 1 verse six. But when he again brings the, his firstborn into the inhabited earth, he says, and let all God's angels do obeisance to him. Now check this out. There's a little star after two. We'll look at the second reference in a second, but let's look at that star. If you go to down to the bottom, it says, or let worship. Okay, that's interesting, but that's not all. <laughs> let's look at this. This is why it must say worship, is this right here, that little reference after him, that B reference. Let's go down and look. It's referring to Deuteronomy 32, 43. It's directly quoting this scripture. Now let's look at it. Now when you turn there, this is what it says in verse 43. Be glad you nations with his people. If you look after the word people in the Septuagint, it says this. Be glad, O heavens, together with him and let all the angels of God worship him. Be glad, you nations, with his people, and let all the sons of God strengthen themselves in him. And then you see the LXX there for Septuagint, and then it says after that, compare Hebrews 1, 6. Now what's interesting is you can see this reference in the 1984 version of the New World Translation, but they took it out of the updated edition. So there is no reference to Deuteronomy 32 in their new publication. So because Hebrews 1.6 is a direct reference to Deuteronomy 32.43, it must say worship. And that's why they couldn't change it in their 1950s version. Hey everyone, I am in editing of this video and I actually came across an interesting scripture this morning while I was doing my Bible reading. And I thought that I would edit this in because this is pretty interesting. But I came across Psalm 97, verse 7 this morning, and it was really interesting because it referred to Hebrews 1, 6. And I thought, what if the New World Translation had the same reference in their Bible? And sure enough, I go and I look in the 1984 New World Translation, and I did see that there is a reference to Hebrews 1, 6 in Psalm 97, verse 7. This is what it says, okay? It's talking about Jehovah God. It says... The heavens have told forth his righteousness, and all the peoples have seen his glory. Let all those serving any carved image be ashamed. Those who are making their boast and valueless gods, bow down to him, all you gods. Now, what it's talking about is the sons of God, the angels. Now, if you look over here to the right, you'll see their reference. The reference directly quotes Hebrews 1, 6, which talks about Jesus being worshipped by the angels. 
So I thought that this was another useful seed that you can use with the Jehovah's Witness, showing them from their own New World Translation uh, that it does indeed show that Jesus is worshipped. It applies the same scripture to Jesus that's applied to Jehovah God. I did look in the reference New World Translation, and I did look in the silver one as well, and I did not find the same reference. It only shows up to my knowledge in the Black New World Translation, the 1984 edition. So thought I'd add that for you guys to kind of add another element to this. So you can show them that Jesus was worshipped through their own publication. Also, this is worth mentioning, just a fun little fact here about firstborn. A Jehovah's Witness will use scriptures like this, Hebrews 1.6, that talk about Jesus being the firstborn over creation as first created. They believe that firstborn means first created. This comes from a misunderstanding of the use of the word firstborn, just like there's a misunderstanding of the use of the son of God or the son of man being the son of something. What I typically like to ask them, and I, I heard this a long time ago from uh, people that were out street preaching to Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know what YouTube channel I got this off of. Someday maybe I'll come across it again, And but I need to give credit to them because this is where I heard it from. But whenever you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness, you can ask them, was David the oldest of Jesse or the youngest of Jesse? And they'll say, oh, well, he was the youngest. So then you can ask them that in the Psalms, when it says that David is the firstborn of Jesse, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that he was the first created. It means that he has preeminence over the other sons of Jesse. So when it says that Jesus is the firstborn of creation, it doesn't mean first created. It means he has preeminence over creation. So that's just an interesting little fact about firstborn and their use of it. And maybe it's something you can tell them and ask them to get them thinking about their definition of what firstborn means. But moving on, because there's more, we're going to use their kingdom interlinear translation for this. And we're going to turn to John 14, 14, because if you can see it in the Greek and then compare it directly, you're going to see the changes that have been made when they omit and take away things that have to do with the deity of Jesus. I'll put it up on the screen so you can see. It says, if ever anything you should ask me in the name of me, this I shall do. If you look to the side, it says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, at first glance, you might be thinking that's what, I mean, not a big deal. Oh, but it is because they omit the word me. Let me read it again. If ever you should ask me in the name of me, this I shall do. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Do you see that? You can't ask Jesus anything in his name. You just ask in his name. They omit the word me. Now, if you can show the witness this, you can say, hey, look, he's asking in the Greek, according to the apostle John, you can ask him anything in his name. All right. Now, this next one is actually one of my personal favorites because I relate a lot to Thomas, but it's John 20, 28. This is one of the clearest places in scripture that Jesus is called God because people always say, oh, Jesus is never called God. Yes, he is many times. The entire book of John is a fantastic read for anybody who denies the deity of Jesus. Now, even in the New World Translation, you can still read this stuff and see it. In fact, I know a handful of Jehovah's Witnesses who have read the Gospels by themselves with no watchtower material because they felt safe doing that. Because remember the mind control, and they did see the deity of Jesus. You know, the Holy Spirit is there, guys. He can use anything or anybody. Planting these seeds can go a long way, but let's take a look at it. John 20, 28. Let's start in verse 27. Next, he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Take your hand and stick it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And answer, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Now, you might think that's just all you would need to talk to with the Jehovah's Witness, but they actually have an argument for this one. They are saying that Thomas said, my Lord, my God. That's their argument. Thomas basically committed blasphemy. You're telling me a monotheistic Jew committed blasphemy? I mean, there's nothing in the context to suggest that Thomas looked up and said, my Lord, my God. But because it's in the text, and there really is no way to grammatically mess with that, 
they keep it in there and they keep that as a defense for saying, no, Thomas wasn't calling Jesus my God, but he very clearly was. And I know quite a few Jehovah's Witnesses, when they were questioning, they looked at that scripture and they knew, they knew that Jesus was God. Just by reading scripture, they saw that if Thomas could call Jesus God, then they could call Jesus God. If Paul prayed to Jesus, and so did Stephen, I can pray to Jesus, you know, and it's in their scriptures. Another one that people like to go to to show that Jesus is God is Isaiah 9, 6. Now, a Jehovah's Witness will not argue with you that this is talking about Jesus. Here's what it says. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, and the rulership will rest on his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now, they also have a defense for this one. Jesus is called Mighty God, not Almighty God. Again, this falls into a weird polytheistic type of belief that would be an abomination to them. But you're calling Jesus Mighty God, capital G in Isaiah 9, 6. But because it's not Almighty God, it can't be Jehovah. It's a very awkward type of position they find themselves in. The irony is they're basically creating two gods by denying that Jesus is God. So just know their argument against that, but also know that this is still in their Bible, calling Jesus Mighty God, capital M, capital G, and their argument for it is pretty weak. Another one that I'm going to show you where Jesus is called God, and he calls himself God, is in the book of John. We're going to use their kingdom interlinear translation for this. I love John. When witnessing with the Jehovah's Witnesses and talking to them, that's when John became my absolute most favorite gospel. Now, this is in John chapter 8 in verse 58. On the right side of their interlinear, it says, Jesus said to them, most truly I say to you, before Abraham came into existence, I have been. Now, if you look to the left in the Greek, I have been does not appear. So you can show them right here that it has been changed for convenience. They're implying this to show that he is created, that he doesn't go and claim to be the I am, but he does. Honestly, the entire gospel of John is an issue for Jehovah's Witnesses, which again is one reason why I believe the Watchtower doesn't want them reading the Bible by themselves. Now, these next techniques I'm gonna show you, I actually learned a long time ago. These are a series of questions that I learned on the internet from another Christian ministry. I wish I remembered who but this is not my original idea. These are techniques that I have used with Jehovah's Witnesses and they have been effective, once again, using their own Bible. I'm gonna show you some scriptures and some questions to ask to the witness as they read them out loud. And hopefully they'll see in their own scriptures the point that you're trying to make, that Jesus is indeed deity. First thing you're gonna to wanna to do is have them read this. Go to Revelation 1.8. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says Jehovah God, the one who is and who was and who is coming, the Almighty. You ask the witness, who is the Alpha and Omega? They will clearly say and agree, of course it's saying it's Jehovah God. Next, you're going to want to go to Revelation 21, verses 6 and 7. It says, and he said to me, they have come to pass. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To anyone thirsting, I will give from the spring of the water of life. Anyone conquering will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Then you ask again, who is the Alpha and the Omega? Who is the beginning and the end? Obviously, they will say Jehovah God. The next one is in Revelation 22 verses 12 through 13. It says, look, I am coming quickly and the reward I give is with me to repay each one according to his work. I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And again, you're going to want to drive the point home by asking the same question. Who is the first and the last? They're going to say Jehovah God. Now you're not going to want to worry too much about context right now because most Christians will realize this is Jesus talking here, but just hang with me. You're talking to a Jehovah's Witness. You gotta let them see it through their J-dub eyes. Now, after doing that, go to one more scripture. Go to Revelation chapter one, verse 17. You're gonna wanna read verses 17 through 18. When I saw him, I fell as dead at his feet and he laid his right hand on me and said, 
do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I became dead, but look, I am living forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and of the grave. Now, after they read this verse, you're going to want to ask them, when did Jehovah God die? This is the first and the last, as you have told me. We have gone over a few times that you believe that the first and the last, the alpha and the omega are one and the same. So if this is the first and the last and he died, but then he became alive, when did Jehovah God die? This is also what you would call letting scripture interpret scripture, which is how we should be reading scripture. Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower, cherry pick scriptures. This is the type of trouble you get into when you do that, because contextually, it all makes sense. Now, arguably, there is one more verse that you can add to that revelation list. It's Isaiah 48, 12, where it says, listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he. I am the first and the last. Just to drive the point home that there's only one first and one last, that throughout scripture, Jehovah God is the first and the last. That's just another scripture that you can add to the list of the revelation scriptures I just gave you to show the witness who the first and the last is. Now, this last section of seed droppers, I'm going to give you uh, full credit to James White. I watched this video clip a long time ago, and I really find it to be useful to use with the Jehovah's Witness, using their scriptures again to show them that Jesus is indeed God. Dr. White makes a few points before he gets into his method. He says, first, without sola scriptura, scripture alone, and tota scriptura, all of scripture, nobody will ever believe in the deity of Jesus. When you pick and choose parts of scripture and form your own God, you can believe in whatever God you want. You can make up any Jesus that you want. But when you take all of scripture and scripture alone, you get a totally different God than that of the watchtower, than that of most religions. So because the Jehovah's Witness doesn't take all of scripture and scripture alone, of course they can't believe in the deity of Jesus. You must always have the watchtower alongside the Bible, either personally or by means of their publications. So the first thing you're going to want to do is use their translation, their publication. You're going to want to ask them to read a text from the Psalms. And you're going to want to use the name Jehovah when you speak with them, because again, Jehovah's Witnesses are told that Christendom will never use this name. They'll be more open to talk to you. Use their translation and turn to Psalm 102 verses 25 through 27. Ask them to read it. It'll say, long ago you laid the foundations of the earth itself, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They themselves will perish, but you yourself will keep standing. And just like a garment, they will all of them wear out. Just like clothing, you will replace them, and they will finish their turn. But you are the same, and your own years will not be completed. Then you're going to ask them, who is this about? And they will unarguably say, of course, Jehovah. And then you're going to want to emphasize and you might sound repetitive, but just make sure that they are sure that this talks about Jehovah, unchangeable creator of all things. This is referring to Jehovah God. This can't describe anybody else other than God himself, right? They are going to say yes. And then you turn back to Hebrews 1. You're going to want to ask them to read verses 7 through 9. Also, he says about the angels, he makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But about the son, he says, God is your throne forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of your righteousness. You loved righteousness and you hated lawlessness. That is why God, your God, anointed you with the oil of exaltation more than your companions. Now it reads differently in their older translation. This is their newer translation I'm using. You can read it in either one. Don't worry about how they changed it or anything like that, just let them have this one. The point that you're trying to make has to do with the following verses, verses 10 through 12. Before you go to 10 to 12, you're going to want to ask them about the verses they just read. They're talking about who? They're talking about Jesus, right? They'll say, yes, this is talking about Jesus. Then you continue to ask them to keep reading in verses 10 through 12. In verse 10, starting, it says, And at the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain, and just like a garment, they will all wear out. Verse 12, and you will wrap them up just as a cloak, as a garment, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never come to an end. 
then you ask them again. This is talking about who? It's talking about Jesus. Now, what's interesting is this. At the end of the verse in 12, you're going to see a reference there. It's a little C. If you go to that reference, it's talking directly about Psalm 102. Why is the writer of Hebrews quoting a scripture that only applies to Jehovah God Almighty himself and then unabashedly applies it to Jesus himself? The point that you're trying to make is the connecting phrase in verse 8 because it's talking about the Son, but the scriptures that follow apply characteristics and attributes that only Jehovah God can have. And this is according to the Psalm that we just read. Let me just drive the point home a little bit more. Look at it again. Verse 10, okay, from verse, from verse 7 to verse 9, clearly talking about Jesus. Verse 10, and, you have a conjunction there, and at the beginning, O Lord, Jesus, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain just like a garment. They will never wear out. Your years will never come to an end. This is talking about God according to Psalm 102. So you can use their own Bible and show them through references, letting scripture interpret itself that this is applied to God in the context of speaking about Jesus. So these are some basic ways that you can talk to a Jehovah's Witness using their own publications. I've had a lot of success with these. I've had great effectiveness. And I know I say this a lot, but please guys do this in love. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. And I really hope that this helps you understand your Bible more, but also helps you and gives you tips on how you can effectively reach a Jehovah's Witness in love.